I don't know if, if you have ever been uh, arrested, you've ever been in trouble, uh, truancy, you know, for some of you that are young, you didn't go to school, so they took you in front of a, a court and the judge, and they judged you by the things that you have done. They'll bring a file, they'll bring information, and they say, well, here is what you've done. Here is what, the reason why you are here. And you begin to, you know, go through it, and you know, I don't remember those things. I don't remember that. I don't, you know, so we go through that, and sometimes, folks, there's a humiliation that happens when you go through the court system. I mean, when you're in front of a judge, you know it's not good. You know, when you're in front of someone that's going to judge you, your past, your situation, it's never good. But just imagine in that same sense, in that same world, to be in front of God. And what's happening here is there is a, a, a business to be dealt with. There's, there's a courtroom and God is putting it all together and he's bringing the people that either did harm to him, said things about him, they worshiped other things besides him and he's, he's furious, he's upset. And a lot of times you have, of course, you got your attorneys and they're, your advocates are fighting for you. But just imagine in this case, the Bible teaches us that the advocate that we have today, Jesus, our advocate, the one that fights for us when they turns around and becomes the judge. That's later in time. Micah chapter 6, that's the Old Testament. What in the world is God trying to tell us in the Old Testament, Testament about a court? What is he dealing with? So we already know that chapter 1, 2, and 3, God is dealing with God's people, the two kingdoms, right? We have 10 in the north and 2 in the south. And they have divided, they've split each other, and they've killed, they've died. I mean, it's, it's a mess. But you see that if there's a division between these two kingdoms. And these are all God's people. These are all God's children. So what is happening? Well, they've rebelled. And rebellion needs to be dealt with. Every time that we go against God, it has to be dealt with. Every time we say something, every time we do something, every time we go against Every time we hate someone, every time we do not forgive, do not honor, do not respect, all these things, so God's about to deal with it. So what's really strange about chapter 6 is that he's dealing with them in a sense of, he makes this comment, and we'll go there. He says, what have I done to you for you to act this way? Wow. Wow. Imagine God standing in that courtroom, and he's got all those people, millions. And he's saying, why are you treating me this way when I have never done anything wrong to you? Now here's 2021, 2019, 20, 21, all this junk that's happened to us. How many people have said, why has God done this to us? Why has God killed so many people with this virus. How many people, I mean, it's just a ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. So what has happened is that this church, this and other churches, church in general, has also split. We got the people that believe in the mask, in the, vir in the, in the vaccine, and take your vitamins and do this and do that and separate yourself. So we got all kinds of divisions in the church, in general. I'm not even talking about the people outside this building. I'm talking about the people in here and in every church. We have a split. We have split it. So guess what? In Micah chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, God is dealing with the fact that they have split themselves when God never intended the church to be split. We've split it from color of skin, from this craziness of, of racial the theory and all this junk that's being implemented into our schools, things that are changing. So what does Eli recommend? A Christian school or homeschool? I, I, I've already made my decision. You know why? Because we're allowing curriculum to be implemented into our schools. And I have teachers in here. I have a professor of curriculum in here. And I had to sit with him and tell him, Carl, is it true that they're, they're, in, they're imposing, they're forcing this belief in our children? And he said, yes. I have a principal that quit. She quit 
in the Kingsville ISD. She goes, Pastor Eli, I had to quit. I said, why? She goes, I just started my job and I had to quit because I couldn't believe what they're teaching in Kingsville ISD. So there's a huge division. Well, I believe this way. You know what I think? Most people want to act like a Republican. Other people want to act like Repub uh, Democrats. I think you should be acting like Jesus. I think you should be acting like the church, like Christ. Start acting like the church. And that's the hard thing that God is about to deal with these people and saying, what have I done to you for you to be acting this way? And watch how the people somehow get this courage to confront God. How many of you know that you cannot confront God? I mean, even the Bible says that no one has ever seen God and lived. So here you have these crazy people thinking, well, I can confront him in court. That's not, that's not going to be good. So you already know that chapter 6, God's going to deal with them in a very kind way. We should never attack with our belief. We should be the example in our belief. Be a walking sermon instead of a speaking sermon. Amen? So you ready for this? Whew. I have like butterflies, like, like you guys are not going to understand this message, you know. Maybe the onlineers will understand, but, you know, here in this room, it's like so quiet. Should we talk about cupcakes again? Nice. I got the worship guy clapping for cupcakes. That's how I pay these guys. That's just how it works. Folks, are you ready for this? You, you got to get your Bible if you can. Uh, if, if you need more lighting, I'm sure Brian is somewhere. We can get more lighting in here if we need it. You, 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 you got to read this. This is powerful. Listen, verse 1, chapter 6. Hear now that the Lord is saying, what the Lord is saying, arise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth because the Lord has a case against his people. Okay, powerful. He's got a case against his people. Now listen to what it says next. Even with Israel, he will dispute. Verse 3, my people, what have I done to you and how have I wearied you? Here's God. There's God. Let's read it again. My people, what have I done to you and how have I wearied you? Answer me. Verse 4, indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt. And ransomed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. My people, remember now what Balak king of Moab counseled. And what Balaam son of Bor answered him. And from Sidim to Gilgal. So that you might know the righteous acts of the Lord. Now if, I don't know in your Bible, but it has quotations from verse 3 all the way to the end of verse 5. So here's the case. If you've ever been in court, sometimes it takes hours, if not days, of one side telling their story of why they are not guilty. Right? They take days. Sometimes you get all the popular ones like Cochrane, those fancy lawyers from L.A., the ones that got money. The ones that, you know, that defended, you know, the, the, the jello guy, the pudding guy. Remember him? You know, all those people, all the rich ones. Let's, let's use all that because they've got the tools. Folks, this is God in front of his babies, his children that he picked from the beginning of time. He didn't pick Texas. He didn't pick New York. He didn't pick L.A. He didn't pick none of those things. He picked Israel. A small little country, the small little state, small, the size of New Jersey. Now he's having to deal with them. This is why we tell families, hey, don't have a lot of kids. Because it's going to be hard. 
to maintain, to discipline, to commit, to do all those things. I don't know how in the world in those days people had 15, 20 kids, you know, and they were able to maintain without being on welfare, without being just working people, doing it right the way it should have been. Our world has changed so much. We've watered down everything, including the gospel. we watered down our message. We want to be as sweet as we can. And guess what? God's going to put us in a position like this and stand right here and say, what did I do to you for you to act like a fool? What have I done? And then he reminds them of what he's done. How many of you, honestly please be honest, could raise your hand and say, I have a testimony. God did something in my life. Can you raise your hand to say, you know what? God did something with me, right? Those of you that didn't raise your hands, maybe today God will do something. Because as long, I mean, I think somebody, if you're alive, God already did something. See, see how we act like fools? I'm just saying. So we don't give glory and honor to God to keep us alive, right, Sarah? He's kept us alive. He gave us breath. When there was a death sentence, God says, it's not their time yet. So he's in front of it. He's saying, hey, what have I done to you? He doesn't say the things that they had done to him. He's wanting them to answer, what have I, what have, what have I done to you for you to act this way? And when he starts naming the kings, when he starts naming Moses, when he starts naming all these people in their life, do you not remember? Do you forget that easy? That I have been good to you? Now, what's really interesting about this story, when he brings this indictment or this, I'm going to say wrath or curse, whatever you want to call it, they still keep themselves in the same position and and standing in front of this vicious God, you've done this to us. You allowed this virus to come. You killed my brothers and my sisters. There's thousands of people sick. There's thousands of them dying. And then he still says, what have I done to you for you to act this way? Now let me take you to something really interesting. Listen to this. How he describes the mountains and the hills and how he says that he's bringing every individual into his presence to be able to acknowledge or tell them, I've been really good to you and you should not be acting this way. So he says, arise, plead your case. Micah pictured a court of law with Israel on trial before the Lord. In the presence of an unshakable witnesses, the mountains, the hills, the strong foundations of the world, of the earth. He's got them as witnesses, and he says, now the court has come to order. The Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. In his court, God will bring his case, his complaints against Israel. So why Why this negative story? Why are we reading this book? Why are we in Micah? I really think that we have to understand, folks, that we need to have our lives restored. If you're a computer person, I'm not. When stuff doesn't work, I've heard the term, you need to reboot. You need to restart. You need to unplug. You need to do all these things, and if none of those things work, then you make a phone call, right? And you call somebody higher, or you call the actual company. I had problems with, uh, you know, my cable in my house, and I did everything that they tell you, right? Because the computer person tells you, unplug it, do this, talk to it, pray for it. I mean, it does all those things. And I did. I even went Pentecostal on this thing, and I even put oil on it. And I spoke in tongues. I spoke in Spanish to it. And I said, hey, componte or you're out of here, man. So I, none of that stuff works. So I called and they answered and they said, sir, uh, we can see that you have problems. 
So why didn't you tell me that there was problems? Right? He said, sir, so we're going to go ahead and ask you, there's a red button on the side of the receiver. If you push it, everything will go black. I said, I don't like black. I don't like to see a black screen. That's scary. He goes, but give it five minutes and everything will be, everything started working. Can you imagine if I could do that to you right now and push your button? (laughs) How many of you agree that we need to be pushed? So somebody needs to push us to do the right thing sometimes. Let me tell you if, you, if you are soft in the middle and everywhere else, you're not going to make it. Because when life gets really tough and you haven't been trained, you're not going to make it. You'll be the first one to say, you know what, mark me. Put the mark on me. I can't, I can't do it. You know why? Because you never fasted. So you don't know how it feels not to eat for a few days. And then you're going to start praying when you've never prayed before. What are you going to pray? Because I am going to disconnect my T-Mobile. You're not going to be able to call me no more. What are you going to do? So if I don't push your red button and reboot you and start you all over again, you're not going to know what to do when it's time to be in front of a vicious God like this and say, okay, and he says, what have I done to you for you to act this way? This is... Powerful, folks. Verse 3, 4, and 5, the Lord complained. He has a complaint. He's complaining. He's got a complaint against his people. I've been in front of a judge before. I've been arrested before. I've been in a position where you, you know what? You have no rights whatsoever. And everything that they tell you, everything that they say that you did, even though you might think, you know what? I don't remember doing that. You have now done. But see, in this case, God is not adding to the crime. He's not adding to the sin of his people. He's saying, I've been so good to you. And I've rescued you several times. Folks, I'm not saying that this is you. I'm telling you, this is God's people. This is is God's people doing this against a mighty and powerful God. And if we don't get our lives together, and those that are listening and watching us online, we're going to fall into a position that any little thing is going to break us. Listen to what it says. The first thing that God says, testify against me. Testify against me. I want you to say whatever you think is right that is coming my way. And listen to what it says. As Israel stepped to the witness stand, God asked them, what have I done to you? He had done nothing but good to Israel and had been repaid with rejection and rebellion. Rejection and rebellion, the exact same thing that we see today against God. Rejection and rebellion. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. That's how God responds to them. I released you. I took you out of there. Not only did God not do evil to Israel, he also did them an enormous amount of good. Listen to this. Number one, he redeemed them. When someone removes the value of who you are, when someone belittles you, you know how the enemy belittles you? Reminds you of your past. Reminds you of your horrible days when you were not a believer. When we know that yesterday no longer exists, right folks? Yesterday does not exist anymore. How in the world can we live back there? Today's a brand new day and tomorrow? Today does not exist. That's why the Bible teaches us to do the best that we can today while we have breath, while we have daylight, he says. Do good. Be generous with people. Talk to them. Listen. Be an example to people. They're going to need us. They're going to need the church one day. Do you know that I believe that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be generous today. I believe that there is 25 to 35% of Corpus Christi that believes in Jesus. I'm, I'm going to say that. Out of 350,000, out of 360,000 people, I'm, I'm, I'm like really generous today. 
Even though we believe that there are more with us than those against us, right? Because we say that. But when I give you numbers like that, what do you think now? When the quote is made, those who are with us are more than those against us, it has nothing to do with human life. It has everything to do with kingdom life. Those that are with the kingdom, those that are in the kingdom, because I will fail you tomorrow. I will fail you on Tuesday. But the word of God is true. The word of God will change your life forever. And you have to know that you will be in front of this king one day and the book will be opened. The Lamb's book of life, the judgment book will also be opened. There's two books. Everybody likes the Lamb's book of life, right? Because their name is on there. But the one that's opened before, that's a scary book. Because even as a believer, even as a Christian, that book is going to be open and they're going to read our stuff. There is no delete, there's no reboot, there's no red button there. When the book is open, we're going to find out exactly, man, I really messed up my life here. I could have won souls for the kingdom, but I was too lazy. I was just not doing my job. And that's how we need to get away from those things and follow what the kingdom wants us to follow. Because this manual tells you exactly what to do. What screw to put on, what washer to put on, how to speak, how to say, everything is in this book. So by the time we get to this chapter 6, you find out that God has, fed, has had enough and he's fed up with his people. So I want you to listen to something. I found this and this was impressive. So the scripture says, I redeemed you from the house of bondage. That's what the Bible says. Not only did God do not do evil to Israel, he did what? An enormous amount of good to them. So guess what? That is beginning to be told to these people. So he reminds them of two, of some kings. He reminds them of Balak, the king of Moab. Numbers chapter 22 through 24 tells the story of Balak and Balaam. After meeting with King Balak and Moab of Moab, Balaam prophesied over Israel four times. How many times? How many times? Four times. How many times do you tell your children by the time they do it? I'm just, I'm just saying. As he spoke forth God's word, he did not curse Israel, but he blessed them each time. Four times, four blessings. When he was unsuccessful, in cursing Israel, Balaam answered Balak on how to bring Israel under a curse. Instead of trying to have a prophet curse them, the Moabites would lead them into fornication and idolatry, and thus God would curse idolatrous and disobedient Israel. So he let them, right? He let them to sin in those two ways that God did not like. And that's when the curse came. So the devil knows exactly what to do to make you fall, for he can bring the pain. God was blessing them, sends four messages. But it's not until they began to do those things that God disliked that they began to feel the curse. So guess how many died? 24,000. Balak did just that sending his young women into the camp of Israel to lead Israel into sexual immorality and idolatry. See that? The devil knows. We talk too much, folks. We talk too much. We write too much on Facebook. You write too much on Twix. On Click Clock. MySpace. You're writing too much of your junk in there. Well, I'm going to unfriend them, folks. You're going to get back on right away. I'm going to un un take myself off. And you're on Twick. <laughs> Please. They have the same issues that we're having today. 
The thing is that the moment that the devil reminds his demons, his, his evil angels, those, that one third that fell from heaven, the moment that they begin to hear, you know what? I know how to get Miss Smith. I know how to get Brown. Is that Brown? It is Brown. Right, you're Brown? Yeah, you're Brown. You know, I know how to get him. I know how to get Julio. I know how to get Lopez. I know how to get Carl. You know why? We talk too much. Mm. 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 We'll find a way to talk with our hands. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm chapter 40, if you read that whole psalm, it teaches you how to be patient. When I have anxiety and depression and all the uh, depressions, why? Why do you have all the depressions in, in life? God didn't make you like that. But we have all the sessions. All the shuns, whatever you want to put to it. Now we got a new one, oppression. You want, to get, you want to go there? That's when the devil has full control over your life. Depression is when oppression is an overtake of your life. Not mine. I don't live by that. All those essions are gone out of my house. I have a sign. You are now welcome here. There's a camera. I'll see you. Folks, that's how simple it is. We are to do what is right, and what happens? We do what is wrong. Because it's easy to do what is wrong. It's hard to do what is right. You know, it's easy to say a lie, but it's hard to tell the truth. But did you know that you don't have to come back to the truth? You don't have to defend the truth. Once you tell the truth, the truth is the truth. But the lie, you got to come up with a different one. You use mayonnaise, and then you have to use Miracle Whip. That's not even real mayonnaise. But it's white. We just do something with it. But that's not how the kingdom works. Let me take you somewhere where it's going to enlighten you. In light of this, Israel must remember that God could never be persuaded to curse Israel. The devil cannot persuade God to curse. Can, can, you, can you hear that? So don't, don't think, oh, I can't believe that God allowed this coronavirus and this. No, no, no. It's us, the ugly people, because we hate people. We do that. We come up with things. I mean, how many coronaviruses are there just in seven days? I didn't even know that it was like extra strength, maximum strength, ultra strength, and crazy strength. I think I've got the crazy one. Listen to this. God cannot be persuaded to curse. He can't. He doesn't work by our rules, by what we are. Listen to this. In the prophet's courtroom, God showed Israel that if they felt cursed in any way, it was entirely their responsibility. If you feel in any way cursed, you allowed it. Can I give you an example? People come to me after they buy a house they can't afford. After they buy a car they can't afford. After they get in debt they can't afford. After they marry somebody that they should have married. Have a bunch of kids when they don't have money. And I tell them, you want me to tell you the truth? Why didn't you come before you did all this stuff? And I would have told you what the Bible says, what not to do. But the fact is, once you did it, you did it. You're married to that ugly person. You make the choice. And I guarantee you, you didn't meet him in church. You met him somewhere outside the church. So you can't be complaining to God when we are responsible for the curse that has come upon us. United States of America, I think we're going through some really strong pressure and some stuff. And it's nobody's fault but us. Because according to my history books that I read in school before they started changing curriculum, Carl, it said that the United States of America was founded on the word of God. That's what I read in history. It's no longer in there, but it was in there at one time or another. So what have we done? We've taken God from everything. But we want God to bless us. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. How many of you believe 
that there has to be a leader in a company or in a position to be able to lead a company. You can't have a bunch of Indians leading, right? You gotta have a chief. You gotta have one that can run it. Our world, our world, everywhere from one point to another is not being run by God, the God of Israel. It's being run by gods that we have created. So why idolatry? Why fornication? Why those two sins? I mean, you know sexuality is the most money maker in our country. We do it through human trafficking, pornography. I mean, this is the number one selling thing. It's billions, if not trillions of dollars. This is the, the, the organizations that make all the money. The church is the poorest. The poorest. You got 20% of the people doing the work and 80% of them get the credit for it. Very small number. So when it's time to go fight a war, man, it's hard to find them. We might have the strongest military, but look what happened to our military. I mean, we're, it's, it's ugly. I know it's getting quiet. Let me, let me take you to Cupcake 101. There we go. You're here still. With what shall I come before the Lord? This is a question for you and I. With what? What can I come to the Lord? How can I make God feel bad? What can we do? What can we say? Our lives are an example of how bad our journey has been as a Christian, as a believer of God. Because if we were truly believers of God, we would never miss an event of the church. Because I guarantee you that you do not miss any event of your job. If they were to call you today and you got to go to work after church, you would go. Even Chick-fil-A. If Mr. Chicken would call, we would go. When will we take a stand on what is right? Because that's what those people, God just told them, you should have done what was right when it was offered to you. There should have been no fornication and no idolatry. Those, those two sins, two simple little sins that can be overcome by the power of his word. The moment that the temptation, you know, a real nice guy, real, a lot skinnier than me with a six pack, and it's, oh my God. You even involve God when you're saying, oh my God, look at his body. Thank you, Jesus. Right? I mean, tell me I'm wrong. Every program on TV, everything, it's all about sex. So it seems like we have the same problem that they have in that time. What year is this? 780 something BC. That's a long time ago. Guess what we're dealing with today? Sexuality. Now you put it everywhere. You put it everywhere. I have to wear black just to look thinner. How's that for my problem? <laughs> you know, Pastor Eli lost weight. No, it was the black jacket. <laughs> Let me take you to verse 8. The reply of the Lord, he has shown you. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do what? Justly. To do, and then next it says, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. He has shown us in Micah that the prophets imagine courtroom, God stopped the shouting of the angry defendant from the witness box. God essentially said this, you act as if it, it is some mystery what I require of you. In point of fact, it is no mystery at all. Everything that God has said has said it from the beginning. Walk justly. Be merciful to people. Be loving. Be caring. He says, do justly. To, the lo to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The Lord answered the contentious witness in open court. What I require of, your, of you isn't complicated. Simply three things. You ready? Do justly. Let me tell you what the Bible says about that. Act in a just, fair way toward others. Treat them as you would want to be treated. Do justly. That's out of the question. It's, it's not everyone is doing this. Number two, love mercy. Don't just show mercy, but love to show it. 
Give others the same measure of mercy you want to receive from, from them to you. The last one, walk humbly with your God. Listen to this. Remember who I am, your God. If you keep that in mind, you will walk humbly before me. That is the biggest concern that I have in our world. Let's take it closer in our city. That we are not walking humbly with our God. It's a very simple mathematical equation here. One plus one equals more God. What's the first thing? Read one chapter a day. Number two, pray. That equals more God. One plus one equals more God. One chapter a day, one prayer a day. So what is that going to solve? Arguments, fights, all kinds of things in a home. In a relationship, before you start a fight, an argument, tell your spouse, let's pray, let's hold hands before we start fighting. And watch how there's no fight. I'm serious. And if you're laughing, it's because you know you're in a fight. But if you were to do this, God would humble you. His, the prayer life of a person, it humbles us. And we are not taking that into effect. There's no effect in that. We're not really loving God justly. So what's the next sin that they do? Idolatry. And I'm going to finish with this. He says idolatry. Now, I want you to know that this didn't come into their camp by surprise. The Bible says that they had already experimented with it. They have already done a couple of statues and they worshiped them. We know what they did with the calf, right? With the golden calf. We already know all these things. So they've already done things that have hurt them and their relationship with God. By the time you get to court, by the time you get to the white throne, by the time that book is open, it, there is no way of us asking for forgiveness. You know that, right? Once you're there, once you clock out here, here, once your time runs out here, there is no intermediate where, you know what, I, I still got a couple of my families that can pray me in. Absolutely not. That is not biblical, folks. There is no holding place. We've come up with that as humans. You know why? Because we want to believe something that is false. The moment you close your eyes here, you're going to open them one of two places. So let me give you what I believe. I believe that for some people, this will, only, this will be the only heaven they will ever see. But for other people, like me, this will be the only hell I will ever see and feel. 113 heat index yesterday. Oh my God, it felt like hell. And then it got cool. And it's like, God, what is happening? And, I, and this is just how it is. We are allowing this court time to be so negative that we can say, God, I've been good. I've done everything you've told me to do. I've witnessed to people. I've given my heart to you. I've, I'm born again. Look, look at me. I wear the stripes. I wear the blood. I have this color on me. I'm not a people pleaser. I'm a God pleaser. Everything else will fall into place. We know that. But the Bible says that that time is going to come when we are to be in front of God himself and these people do not know what to do. So I want to give you some homework. I want you to read Micah chapter 6, verse 6 through 16. Now let me tell you what that's all about before I get you to stand and pray with me. The Bible says that he requires certain things from his people. And we might know how to do what I'm doing. I might know what to do with all these things, but I am still far from, from God. Because I can preach it, I can sing it, I can do all those things, but my heart is really far from him. I know people that have gone to church all their life and they've never been born again. 
It's time that you are born again. It's time that you make that decision. It's time that you change your ways. You know how I know you? By where you sit and how you act. Two simple things. By where you sit and how you act. I know that I can trust you with something by how you react with your personal life. But most of the time, you'll never hear anything negative from me to you. I need you to do this. I need you to... No. You know why? Because I have a hard time believing that you can handle what's on your plate. And I need you to handle what's on your plate today. I need you to do what is right. If you are sick, call on him who heals the body. If you are struggling in life, call the one that will line up your life. You got to call on his name, the name which is above every name. What's his name? Jesus. Yeah. You got to call on his name. Don't be ashamed of his name. Because the enemy will quickly bring the negative in your life. It's about time that we come out of that bondage. How many years do we have to be in bondage before we know what freedom feels like again? I want to be free. Right now that you have freedom, pray. Right now that you have this freedom, read your word. One plus one equals more God, right? One chapter a day, one prayer a day. Simple. I need you to stand to your feet.